So my, yeah. Yeah, my name is Dr. Cynthia Miller. Oh. So I have a PhD in psychology and it's specifically about the psychology of change and cellular transformation. So my life's work has been about learning how to change the cellular structures of our body so we can create change out in the world. So I see that trauma or energy from our families gets locked into the cellular structure. And in order for us to shift, we have to change our bodies at a very deep level. And then as that happens, we can start to think new thoughts and start to create a, a better world for everyone. Do you do the counseling for people? Yeah, I spent 20 years, I spent 30 years counseling people and leading groups and doing meditations. And then now I have audios that I sell on the internet uh, guiding people of how to shift different patterns in their life. I'm also an artist and a photographer and an author. Mm -hmm. I've written one book called The Art of Radical Gratitude and I'm working on my next manuscript which is about my life and radiation and about the awakening of consciousness. Because I feel that in order for us to create peace in the world, we need to change our thinking. And when enough people change how they're thinking, then together we can create a much more peaceful world. So this is the first time I've really spoken about my experiences to large groups of people. And going to the schools and being with the Hubaksha and listening to their stories was very, um, it was very hard and very difficult for me to hear their stories and then have to get up and tell my stories. But the amazing thing was is that on some level our stories are very, very similar. That we've been through a lot and it's time for people to learn more about the effects of radiation. Um, I have something called the Radiance Project, which is um, art that I created when the radiation was coming out of my body. And then 10 years later, after I created the art, I um, found the bombs on the internet that had just been declassified. These were bombs that my father had helped build and he'd watched explode. And so I have this series of art that I've created that I want to get out to the world. So I'd shown it to a friend in Mexico and she met Robert, who is the head of Hibakshu Stories, and heard his story. And so she had the two of us to lunch, to meet, and we started talking. And we were talking about our stories and about the importance of using gratitude and we realized our projects were very similar. So then he invited me to come to New York. What I've been wanting to do is to create a place or a venue for my art project. So people could see large photos of the bombs and photos of my art, which is similar to the bombs. And then I have photos of flowers that I took when I was working with gratitude. And then the final series is photos of light. So that's about the transformation from radiation into light and awakening. So that's one of my dreams is to have an art show that could travel the world so that people can have a visual experience of what we've been talking about. When I was five years old, I could see um, this explosion. I'd never seen it visually, but I could imagine an atomic bomb and I could imagine the radiation that would be falling on the ground and getting in the water and getting in our food and getting in the earth. And when I was five, I was, one night at dinner, I said, who will clean up the mess? And that's the only time I was ever sent to my room. But ever since then, I've been working internally of that problem of what can we do? What can I do as one little person 
to start to change. And I, through all these years of research and working with thousands of clients, I realized that as we each come to deeper peace within our own bodies, then we can also create an external peace in the world. But it starts within. And as each one of us look at whatever we're fighting against inside ourselves and bring in gratitude and thank whatever that part is that we don't like in ourselves, then that creates changes in our nervous system. And as that happens, then our brains start to shift. And from there we can start to create and think of new solutions. So my father was a construction engineer and he um, started out in the beginning of the war working on factories and making them into munitions plants. And then he was called to start working on the Manhattan Project. He worked at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, working on the uranium, and then he built Hanford in Washington, and that was the first plutonium plant. And then he was transporting the plutonium and the uranium to Los Alamos, which is the Manhattan Project, which is where the first atomic bombs were created. And, and what happens is that radiation gets in your body and it travels to your bones, but it also travels to your sex cells. So in men, radiation gets lodged in their testicles. So when I was conceived, I was full of radiation. So from conception through my whole life, I've had radiation, plutonium poisoning. Uh, my whole life, but I had headache, a solid headache for the first 26 years of my life. And then I changed my diet. And one day, for like an hour, I didn't have a headache. I was shocked. So I called on my friends, do you have a headache? And I call another friend, do you have a headache? And everybody said, no, why are you asking, do I have a headache? Um, and I had no reality that everybody didn't have a headache. It was shocking to me. And so then I wanted to know, well, what do other people feel like? If they don't have headaches, what else do I have that other people don't experience? It was almost like learning how to walk or talk, to learn how to be in no pain. And it sounds funny, but there were times I would retreat back to having a headache because it was familiar and it's what I knew. Even though I didn't want to be in the pain, um, when I would get too stressed, it was easier to have a headache than it was to learn this whole new world of how to function without pain. Yeah, I believed everybody had a headache and you just didn't talk about it. Um, there were lots of things in my family you just didn't talk about because everything was top secret. And so I thought, oh, you just don't talk about headaches. You don't talk about being in pain. That's how I thought the world worked. <laughs> it was kind of unusual, but that's, that's all I knew. Everybody in my family always hurt. He always had a headache. We always were in pain. So I just assumed everybody else's family was always in pain, and none of my friends talked about having a headache, so I thought you just, it was just how it was, and so you just don't talk about it. Did you have other symptoms too, besides headache? Um, when I was a child, I would pass out about three or four times a week in the mornings, and I used to throw up a lot. Well, I've thrown up my whole life a lot. It's kind of this, radioactive projectile vomit comes out and it's not fun. <laughs> so I grew up during the Cold War and a lot of people had bomb shelters and my best friend up the street had a bomb shelter and sometimes we would sneak down in the bomb shelter to play even though we weren't supposed to be there. And I kept thinking, how were we supposed to, we were supposed to stay in the bomb shelter for a few days and then come out of the bomb shelter. 
but I couldn't figure it out. I thought adults were pretty stupid because I could see this radiation getting like on all the leaves and the plants and getting on the ground and getting in the water. And I couldn't figure out how to get the radiation, how to clean it up, how to get it off the plants or how to get it out of the water. So one night at dinner, I said, who will clean up the mess? I didn't have the vocabulary or the words to say anything more. And at that time, talking about the environment, nobody talked about the environment in the early 50s. But I, I was worried because I could see that it seemed impossible because it was this dust and how do you get dust out of the water? So I was trying to figure it out and that's when I was sent to my room. <laughs> so I grew up in Southern California and the Manhattan Project was in Los Alamos. But my father's work was mostly in different parts of Nevada and he was um, one of the directors of Ina Weetok at the South Pacific Proving Ground. So he would leave sometimes for 13 months or a year at a time and then come home. So I wasn't ever in the vicinity of anything that was going on. I was leading, you know, just a regular life. But I heard little bits and pieces about the bomb. And my father would go and watch the bombs explode and actually his picture was in National Geographic of just wearing these goggles watching bombs explode so he would actually bring the radiation home with him which at the time the scientists didn't know anything about how all that works so he watched 131 nuclear explosions but he would be gone for months. He'd watch the explosions. Then right after the explosions, his job would be done, so he'd come home right after the explosions. But he would bring that energy with him. So each time he came home, it was almost like another nuclear blast coming into the house. There was very little known about the radiation. And you know, he would change his clothes, but it's almost like if you've been around someone who's like very angry, you can feel their energy as being really angry, or someone who's really sad, you can feel their energy as being sad. Well, that's kind of like what it was like around the radiation. You could, uh, this energy would come home with him. It's nothing you can see, um, you can't smell it or anything. Um, and at the time they didn't know how to really monitor it, but it's like we could, the energy, you could feel this something as he would come home, but there was no information or no knowledge about it, and we were just little kids, so, you know, nobody knew anything about it at the time. No, I'd never even heard the word until I met Robert. I had no idea Sorry. what that meant. And just this week, I'm starting to even begin to feel like that could apply to me. So it's a very new concept. Well, after this week, I think, yes, that's appropriate that I am a hubaksha. But it never would have occurred to me before. And I think there are many people all around the world who've experienced radiation who probably would not consider themselves in those terminologies. Um, there have been nuclear tests all across the United States and radiation is all over the United States. There's also been nuclear tests all around the world. So there's areas of radiation all over the world that people have been exposed and they don't know it. I know it because I've, when my parents died, I received all these documents um, saying what my father had done. But there are lots of people who are maybe are downwinders where the wind just blew the radiation. So they have no idea 
that they've even been exposed to radiation. So I think it's a much greater problem than we're currently aware of or currently addressing. So I had, for years I went to doctors and then I just gave up. Because I would say to the doctors, you know, my father built bombs, maybe that could be something about what I'm experiencing. And all the doctors would say, oh no, you grew up in Southern California, you couldn't possibly have anything. So um, I'd completely given up on doctors. And one of my good friends, brother um, had been studying these special techniques on how to work with people with radiation. He was a doctor. She wanted me to meet him and I said, no, I won't meet him. So she planned a dinner party and she had the two of us to dinner and then she left and said, you two have to talk. <laughs> so then he, he told me about a doctor to go see. And this doctor had been in the service, and as part of his service duty, he was sent to Chernobyl to help clean up the radiation after the disaster at the nuclear power plant. And he had gotten nuclear radiation. And then he went through this process to heal his own radiation. So when I met him, he knew what I was talking about. And he heard me and so I felt like I could trust him because he had already been through it himself. So that was quite a big, a big event and that's when I was 52 years old. So then I went through chelation which was um, a process of getting shots. So I would get shots all around my head and my face and down my neck and shots in my arms and shoulders all throughout my body and I would get a hundred shots every week and each shot was incredibly painful and this process went on of a hundred shots every week for one and a half years and what it was was um, it was procaine and procaine's kind of like novocaine when you go to the dentist and so I would get a little bit numb and then the DMPS would bind with the radiation and then when it comes out your body it's incredibly painful. It felt like rusted barbed wire was being ripped through my brains. It felt like hot molten lava was running down my legs. Um, it was not a good process. It was not fun. <laughs> it helped with some. So plutonium travels to inside your bones. So the stuff that was deep in my bones, um, there's still radiation deep in my bones. So it comes out now more gradually. So now it comes, it's still in my skull and I feel it dripping down my gums, around my teeth. And it gets my lymph glands get really knotted up and really painful and the back of my neck still gets very painful. Yeah, my bones used to hurt more than they do now, but they're weak. I've broken bones all over my body and I didn't know that was related to the radiation. It's just, you know, both my hands, my shoulders, my ribs, my legs, my feet, so they've become very brittle and from the radiation. <clears throat> oh, I was so sad. Yeah, it was very upsetting for me because there are all these people who are going to be exposed and suffering and they've lost their homes and the land is all has radiation and um, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years so they won't be able to grow food there and it, it really makes me very upset. So my idea for preventing these things is that we need to shift our consciousness. I feel like um, humanity is like little children in the schoolyard where they're bullying each other and where they're like, my father's better than your father. 
and that we're creating war from this um, state of not being very conscious. As we, I've studied how the brain works and the oldest part of our brain is 500 million years old and that's the part that relates to fear. And then on top of that's the limbic system and that's about 50 million years old. And then on top of that is our neocortex and that's only 2.6 million years old. So our new part of our brain is pretty new. And the ancient part of our brain is the part that's about fear. So when we get in fear, our, our biological response is to fight and create war or to run away or to become immobilized and freeze. And in my research I've discovered that as we bring in gratitude and thank the fear and the anger, the ancient reptilian part of your brain will calm down. And as that calms down, then the neurons in the newer part of our brain can function. But when we're in fear, all the energy goes to the fear part of your brain and you can't think clearly. So it's about each individual can choose if you want to be in fear or if you want to be in gratitude. But if you're in fear, most of the neurons aren't functioning in the part of your brain that can create good solutions. So I think it's up to each one of us to start learning to shift. I think we're at an amazing point in history where we can consciously change our own nervous systems. There's been a lot of research recently about how our brain works and what our intention can do to shift how our nervous system functions. So I think as each person can start to look at what makes them afraid and start to heal that inside themselves, then we can start to think more clearly and create a better world. So rather than it being somebody else's problem, when enough people get together and start getting more peaceful inside their own bodies, and start thinking more clearly, then together on a very global scale, we can create something that's completely new and different from what we know. Because war has been around since the beginning of recorded history. And just as when we're little children, when you're two or three and you're wanting everything for yourself and you want all the toys and you want to fight, then as you grow up and get older, then we can are peaceful. Well, humanity needs to grow up. Humanity's still at this level of fighting and war, but when humanity can evolve to a higher state of consciousness, is, that's my idea of how we can start to change the world. So my research is psychological and partly physical. Um, years ago I had a near-death experience and after that I could see inside people's bodies. And so I can see the cellular structure inside bodies. And when I was working with clients for all these years, I could see what was going on inside. So that led me to learn more about the, the body and how it works. And then just recently there's been a lot of information by medical doctors and physicists and scientists about how your brain works. So I've been researching all of that and bringing all that together. Uh, so there's a lot of information that we can bring together right now that we can shift by just changing our thinking, we can change our physical bodies. And as we do that, um, uh, my hope and vision is, is that we can create a, a new world that's happy and filled with peace. 
but when we still are coming from hating ourselves, then that gets reflected out in the world. But as we start to forgive ourselves and love ourselves more deeply, then that gets reflected out in the world. I was um, 27, I was getting acupuncture for my migraine headaches. By then I realized there were regular headaches, sinus headaches, migraine headaches, because I'd had all of them. So I was getting acupuncture for my migraine headaches, and they put the needles in, and I started getting really sick. And I went home, and my husband, I was always sick, and my husband at that point would leave. He was so tired of me being sick. But I made him promise to not take me to the emergency room because that was in 1974 and acupuncture was not known in the United States very well. And I was sure that I would be killed if I went to the hospital. So that night I went into a coma and traveled down the tunnel with the white light and you know, had this near-death experience. And I begged to die. I did not want to come back because it had been so painful. But I was told I had, you know, it was not my time to die. So I came back. And then a week later, this energy came up my body and out my head. And that's when I could see inside everybody's bodies. And that lasted for 30 years. So I could see inside everybody's bodies. I could see the auras of the plants and the trees. Um, I'd go in libraries and all the thought forms and all the books would hit my nervous system and I would pass out. I'd pass out in the grocery store. I'd go in record stores and I could hear all the music that had been played, like the jazz and the classical and the rock and all that would collide in my nervous system and I would pass out. So it was very difficult to function. Over the years I kept praying to not see. <laughs> I don't want to see so much. So then it was just when I had a client and I was working with them and I have their permission, then I could just see a little bit. But that took years for that to happen. So now I don't see so much, which is good. I don't want to see everybody's. How, how about yourself? Can you see? I can see in my own body. It takes a lot of energy to look inside and see. But I think that's the way that I could heal my own plutonium, was that I could see what it looked like. And then as I brought in the gratitude and was spinning the gratitude through it, I could see how it was changing. So I think it was a gift for me to be able to keep keep healing my own body. Otherwise, I probably would not still be alive. Are I, you creating the I, I need the funding. <laughs> so I don't know. I would like it to happen. So it, each, there's eight tetrads, which I'm calling. So eight, eight series, and each series has four different pieces of photos. So, and I'd like the photos to be very large. So I would like it to be a very large exhibit where people can go in and experience the transformation just by looking at the art. Yeah, so the artwork is on um, my website called radianceproject.org and it shows a picture of the bombs that my father watched and then the art that I created when the radiation was coming out of my body. Um, when the radiation was coming out, I would wake up in the middle of the night and my whole body would be just pulsating. And I would get up and paint with my hands. And there'd be art all over the floor and then I'd go to bed and I'd wake up early and pick up all the art so no one would see it because I didn't want anyone. Because uh, to me it was just horrible art. Um, but then years later, after both my parents died, I inherited all the information about my father's work. And then five years after that, I saw the bombs on the internet. So I created the art 
10 years before I saw any of the bomb photos. And the similarities are very surprising. Same, you know, you can see the similarities between the art and these bombs. And then a few years later, I was working with gratitude to heal my own radiation. I had this um, electroshock in the back of my neck for 60 years and I was just ready to commit suicide. It was just way too painful. And this energy or this in something just came up and said, choose gratitude. And I had no idea what that meant. But I started spinning gratitude all through the pain in my neck. And I started thanking the pain. And I started thanking the radiation. And my mind would just go nuts. It's like, how can I thank this? I had been fighting against the radiation my entire life. And that wasn't doing any good. It was like a war in my own body. So as I gave thanks to the war in my body and opened up, um, it all started to calm down and the pain started to heal. And so during that time I started taking photos of flowers because to me the flowers are beautiful and they were representing gratitude. And then a few years later I saw the bombs and my art and then the flowers and they were all similar. And then a few years after that I was taking photos in Mexico of the fireworks and that was like this celebration of life and the light. And then I saw that was this connection of the bombs and my art and the photos of the flowers and this light. So it's been 15 years in the making of creating all of this, but it, it wasn't my mind creating it, it just happened in this organic way of evolving.